All right, cool. So just uh, so you're aware, if you do have any questions in the end, uh, feel free to note them down during the talk. Um, we'll have room for questions, and uh, my friend Carrie will hand you a mic. Um, just maybe raise your hand afterwards. And with that, let's kick this thing off. Uh, thank you for um, joining me on this lovely Thursday afternoon on one of the rare days where it doesn't rain in Seattle, so I feel very honored. Thank you so much. Cool, so yeah, um, a little bit about myself real quick. I'm Tina, I'm a technical writer by trade and a nerd since I was born. So I'm here because I care about documentation, just like every single one of uh, the people in this room here. And um, yeah, this talk basically covers some foundational principles of what makes good content. Um, and although I work for Google, um, everything that I'm presenting today is based on my own research, my own findings, so I'm very happy they paid for my travel, but the content is mine. Okay, <laughs> yeah, let's get started. Um, so yeah, um, first of all, um, you know, we have probably a few engineers in the room here, maybe hands up, who's, who's an engineer by trade? Yeah, yeah, nice, nice, quite a few people. Um, and yeah, um, who, who's a tech writer? Who identifies as a documentation person? Ooh, nice, 50-50. So yeah, before engineers can get to work, usually, they need to understand their hardware and code ecosystem that they work in. And the same goes for anyone who wants to create content. They kind of need to understand the hardware that we're dealing with, which is like human brain, right? And um, we are lucky. We have a manual for that, which is called the cool field of psychology. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I care deeply about this. So I spent a lot of time making this deck, and I hope you get something out of this too. So speaking of psychology, it's a huge, vast field. And not everything in psychology is about like cognition, which is what we're going to deal with today. So cognitive psychology basically means um, like this is the science that describes how we are processing information and attain knowledge. And uh, we do that through thoughts, but also real life experiences. And I want to kind of illustrate real quick, just going right in the deep end uh, <laughs> to kind of explore how that works. Um, so we actually have several kinds of memory in our brain that work nicely together. And the main thing that the memory does is decide which information is important and for how long. So in a nutshell, cognition works like this. We register something with our senses, and that goes all into the sensory memory. Um, it passes through the working memory, and then if it's important enough, it makes it all the way back here into the long-term memory. And let's look at a simple example to illustrate that process. Let's say you register this random assortment of numbers, and from context, just based on where you are, you're currently exchanging numbers, someone you met at the conference. And your working memory kicks in, just parses those numbers as a sequence chunks them up for you to remember then. And dang, you've run out of battery, so you can't put it in your phone right now. What do you do? You have to remember it, right? You have to remember that you met a cool person here and their phone number. Um, so one way how to do this would be to repeat this number over and over again. And yeah, this, I haven't actually met Linda. It's <laughs> unfortunate, but you know. Um, also, please don't call this number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so um, yeah, this is uh, one way how we learn things through repetition. But our main goal is to learn today what how we can chunk or like you know edit information in a way so that we can absorb it easily. All right. So I'm gonna go through those different types of memories in a bit more detail now. Um, just so you are aware of the constraints of these systems. Um, here, our sensory memory is basically our API to the outside world. Um, like everything that comes through like your ears, your eyes, your mouth, your nose gets parsed in the brain. Um, and yeah, this is a kind of a, a memory that deals with a lot of information all at once. So your attention span for here is like, very short. So for example, if you're dealing with auditory information, 
uh, you can store that for like three seconds. <laughs> um, for visual information, you have maybe 800 milliseconds to determine if it's something important or not. And that's why it matters to optimize for the brain because if you lose your folks here, they are gone, right? Um, so how, how, how do we retain information then? And how does, how does it get passed to the working memory? Relevance, right? Um, relevance is context specific. So yeah, going back to kind of that phone um, example here, like if you saw that number like smeared in a bathroom stall, nah, you wouldn't probably go out of your way to remember it. Um, so yeah, um, that's why knowing your user matters because they filter through what they need all the time. So yeah, um, if it's relevant, nice, check. We're going to the working memory, which I'll explain now. Um, yeah. Working memory is cool because it has longer attention spans, usually for like up to 30 seconds. Um, and one part of your working memory is called the central executive. And that part is important because it divides where and it, like attention should go. Um, yeah. And yeah, depending on which senses register input, you actually have different so-called loops that then process this information. And this will be important and critical for later on. Um, yeah, am I missing something? Yeah, I'm just gonna go through those uh, two loops and explain them in detail. And for those of you in the room, kind of already got a spoiler. <laughs> but yeah, so let's see if this works. So Queen is gonna help us here um, to illustrate my point. Um, oh, mama mia, mama mia. Mama mia, let me go. Okay, who has an earworm now? <laughs> right? So when you're listening to a song, it passes uh, through your sensory memory, like your ears, and ends up in the working memory. And it's com uh, coming in a into a system called the phonological loop. And that um, part of your brain repeats back what you just heard. So you can either remember it for, for longer term or um, just to remember, remember it enough so you can finish your task. Um, so yeah, usually you hear the, you can retain about three seconds. Um, so maybe if I stop speaking now, some of it might just ring in your brain. Rings and rings, no, don't worry. <laughs> cool, um, and uh, interestingly enough, you don't necessarily have to rely from outside input. Um, even if you just like remember a song, um, the same system activates, so that's called your inner ear. And um, yeah, that, that works for remembering songs or if you're just kind of talking or reciting something to yourself. Um, if you're thinking about speech, for example, even if your lips do not move, the brain is still activating. So if you're preparing for a talk and you're like in a public space, you can just read through it and just narrate it to yourself. It will work. So. Do not forget, mamma mia, let me go. <laughs> Let's go on and um, talk about visual inputs. Um, so your eyes usually um, kind of register information and they create a copy of your scene and put it in the working memory. And yeah, scientists have a cool fancy and name for that, the visual spatial sketch pad. So visual for like just stuff you see and then spatial because you also register depth and placement of things. Um, so that loop does both. Um, and yeah, so we process visual cues here and it's very straining to memorize an information, uh, information like that, right? This wedding picture, for example, there's a lot of things going on. Like there's a bride, the groom, all of the guests, there's like confetti or rice, I don't know. Um, so usually what we do to remember this though, is we make an abstraction, right? So when we are at the wedding, we probably remember the bride and groom being happy and um, sharing a very sweet kiss. And um, I picked this picture. I know it's like very far removed from like technical content, uh, but I picked this picture because um, when you're at a wedding, usually you are in a heightened emotional state. So you're, more likely to remember already because it's an emotionally charged um, situation and your brain more likely is prepared to 
remember important situations. And let's come back to technical um, documentation and software. How do you think your users feel when they use your software? So you can give me a thumbs up if you feel like they're, oh, they're calm and they're relaxed, or maybe they're just like neutral. Um, but give me a thumbs down if you think they're stressed or frustrated or, you know, like, okay, see some thumbs down. A lot of thumbs down. <laughs> um, a middle thumb, okay, cool. I'll, I'll take that maybe as neutral. Um, so that actually, like the emotional state is pretty important because if your users feel like that, <laughs> if they're stressed, learning gets harder for them because stress is not just a feeling that we have, it's actually a whole process in your body. And when your primal brain goes into fight or flight mode, um, it will snatch away resources that help you think otherwise. It will make sure that your muscles are tense, that you can run fast, that you can deal with the situation. And usually um, our learning capabilities are greatly reduced when we are stressed. But seeing all of your thumbs now, oh no, <laughs> like that's how our users feel a lot of times. So in, in that kind of context, like how do we then facilitate information processing? Um, okay, yeah, so just remember, primal brain wants us to survive, can't learn. Um, so let's make content digestible. And I've brought you a real world, world example here from when I had to travel during the pandemic, which was pretty stressful, and every airline kind of had their own rules about how to show up, what kind of mask to wear. And this is a real life screenshot from Lufthansa, <laughs> not to like bash them or anything, but this is what they told me about how I should prepare. And I'll give you maybe a few seconds to scan it. So, how easy to understand is that? I see some head shakes. Yeah, no, not really, right? Um, so Lufthansa could have made my travel experience a little bit easier if they just kind of broke down the information into something I can scan. So with this list, I can just look at my collection of masks I have at home and pick the one that's appropriate for my flight. And um, that applies to technical content as well, especially like screenshots. Um, this is a screenshot from Google Ads. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things happening here. Um, it's a very powerful tool. So naturally, over time, there's a lot of UI elements coming in. Um, but if I now were to write a piece of documentation urging a user to create a new advertising campaign, and that was the screenshot, <laughs> Like, where would they start? Like, there's no wayfinding points in here. So something that the uh, Google Ads UI team, or like the documentation team does, is they work with so-called simplified screenshots. So oftentimes they would abstract away unnecessary noise um, to just focus on the action in question. And yeah, simplified screenshots are great in many regards. Um, they help with orientation and recall, and they're very robust to UI changes. And if there's no text in it, you don't have to translate it. So, you know, um, the best thing here, though, is like that the cognitive load is much lower for the viewer. Cool. So, um, to recap, we have the phonological loop for everything like with audio, visual spatial sketchpad for anything that our eyes register. And what happens if we need to use them simultaneously? Like, can we do that? So thumbs up if you think, yeah, we can, or thumbs down if you say no. Okay, I see mix, that's good. Um, so we actually can use both of these systems together. So for example, driving a car, reading a book, um, watching a movie, or listening to a presentation, you definitely use those systems all of the time. Like, for example, when you drive your car um, and you just you know, feel comfortable, you can easily listen to the radio without endangering other people, I hope. <laughs> um, but hey, wait, like reading a book, wait, 
that's just a visual process, right? So show me your thumbs again. Do you think there's several things involved here or is it just like visual? Like maybe thumbs up for visual only and then down for like concurrent. Okay, I have a smart audience. <laughs> yeah, um, you're right. Um, there's several, uh, several different processes involved. And uh, let's check out how we process text because most of our content is text. Um, yeah, so this is just my description from the talk. And uh, maybe take just a few seconds to read it. You have, don't have to read all of it, but um, that will help with my point. So maybe just like um, go and read. All right, so as you were looking at this, who actually here heard themselves talk in their head? Yeah? Yeah, me too. Yeah, I, I do that all the time. And yeah, so this is actually working as intended because so you always register the text, obviously. Um, and then your phonological loop kicks in. Remember, you, you know, your inner speech, your inner ear, they kick in and kind of narrate to you what you've just seen. Um, so yeah, oh yeah, okay. This is just like the example from before. Uh, in a different orientation because I'm adding some context, yay. Um, all right, let, so encoding, right, is one term that scientists use to just describe how you represent information. So text would be like a visual encoding here. Um, and then if, you know, you just kind of use that. But if you added um, something that conveys the main point, like this is the brain talk. So I, I could just add like a, icon to my, um, to my like, description as well to just activate this other loop as well. So if I trigger both your phonological loop and the visitor spatial sketchpad at the same time, that will usually help with our information retention um, because yeah, we can concurrently use them and we should. So this technique works especially for videos if you make sure that the, the imagery kind of complements the narration, um, and that way you're creating way better screencasts. There is a pitfall, though, in combining, and we're gonna illustrate that with Elsa. So Elsa, <laughs> the queen of a frozen kingdom, she's an expert in making snowballs and wants y'all to learn how to make a snowball, and she opted for just putting a slide together and then narrating the slide. So I'm just impersonating Elsa, I don't know, I don't do her justice, but so I would be like, pack a snowball with the hands from the bottom of the section and scoop a handful of snow with both hands, and pack it together into a round shape. And that's like what she narrates while she has that same text on the slide. We, we see slides like that all the time, right? Um, how do you think though, um, Oh no, I spoilered, damn it. So my question for you would be like, how well do you think that works? Um, like if you just put your information and your narration, if they are the same things, do you think that works well? Like maybe yes, maybe no. Okay, yeah, I spoiled it. No, it doesn't work well at all. Um, and that is because we're triggering the same loop. So if you're already listening to someone speak, and then you're also trying to read the same thing, um, your inner narration will clash with what your ears perceive. Um, so yeah, for example, if you're concentrating on coding, a lot of developers like techno because there's no lyrics in here um, and that usually works well, but if you listen to a, a very new song and you focus on um, like the lyrics, you might just get way too distracted. And that's what happens, that like happens here as well. And I like to call it PowerPoint karaoke. So if you don't take anything away from this talk, maybe make this your one number one lesson. Don't do PowerPoint karaoke. Don't overload the same systems. Okay. So yeah, instead she could just like um, put a visual in here. Yeah, so I'm just gonna sum this up real quick because we haven't really talked about the long-term memory. So we've covered sensory memory, great will filter out if it's important or not for us to be working with it. Working memory processes things. Um, and then 
if you've accomplished your task and you don't need that knowledge anymore, things will be tossed, disregarded. But oftentimes, we are in situations where we have to remember things. So getting into the long-term storage is what we'll cover next. All right. But when I say long-term storage, long-term memory, there is, ta-da, yet another collection of systems that work together that make up your long-term memory. And um, so this is an image that I pulled from a paper that I highly recommend. It's linked out here. Um, all of the blue sections here um, are basically system, subsystems of the long-term memory, but we'll only focus like on this mid-sandwich layer in teal. Um, so there's explicit memory and implicit memory. All right, so explicit memory focuses on, that is a type of memory that retains things that you've learned. Um, so for example, if I asked you what's four times five, you would probably just shoot right at me, it's 20, because you've learned your tables in school and you don't even need your working memory to calculate five, points four, uh, five times four or, or the other way around. Um, so yeah, all facts and events that you've, that you've learned um, go here, explicit memory. And then implicit memory is a pretty cool place as well because um, that holds knowledge about procedures and emotional reactions that you had. So for example, if you think about brushing your teeth, if you're a kid and you're just learning it or watching your kids learn it, it's very chunky and the motions are like wild and they maybe hurt their gums uh, because they are currently just, you know, they don't have a pattern yet learned for how to brush their teeth effectively. Um, and now if we do it as adults, like we don't even pay attention anymore. Maybe we're watching YouTube off the side. Uh, we just basically have stored it in an implicit memory. So this is where routines go, which is interesting for documentation because a lot of times we're telling or we're teaching people how to do certain things. And if you're already so familiar with it, this is very hard to articulate. Like try to explain which angle you have to hold your toothbrush to not hurt your gums, right? Like I can't, um, so very tricky, but you have to keep that in mind as well. Um, yeah, so as technical writers or developers that write content, we often deal with content that goes into both of those systems, right? Some of these, like maybe tech specs is something we want people to remember and other things like running pip and getting an update for a package is something that we try that will become implicit, just muscle memory. Cool. Okay, but how do we kind of bridge that gap? <laughs> like there's a, lot, there's a huge gap on my screen for a, a reason. Um, so between the working memory and the long-term memory is the magical middle of mental models. And those are representations of things we know. And they glue together um, like all the facts and beliefs and emotions and behaviors that we have. And the first way or first like method into uh, getting to the long-term memory is compilation. And that's just a fancy sciencey term for repetition. And when we go back to the phone number example, that's how you've learned the number by repeating it several times over. Um, but yeah, it's pretty daunting, right? Like if you had to learn everything in your life via repetition. So repetition is pretty good for routines that you have to practice. Um, but there's another way for learning, which is um, elaboration. And that's just a fancy science term for basically building on what you already know. And um, yeah, one way to do that is simple as like metaphors, for example, which exist a lot in tech. Like, you know, the term scrolling comes from reading a scroll and it's just like this huge piece of paper that you move. Um, so a lot of times, especially in tech, we're not even aware anymore that a lot of our words we use came from metaphors. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Um, cool. Yeah. So, hey, just a quick shout out. You made it through the hard sciencey part. <laughs> now we're actually covering some more um, 
practical, like, practical tips and how you can kind of put this all together because that's what you're here for, right? And one thing that we all just know all too well of being open source maintainers or contributors is like time is of the essence and we do not have a lot of hours to give to um, our communities, especially as volunteers. Um, so we have to be careful of where and how we spend our time on. And a good way to ensure that, you know, there's consensus and meaningful action towards documentation is to plan it. And um, I will just present like one method how you can plan your documentation um, that kind of takes into account what we've just heard. Um, but that's not the only way. So, um, does this show up? No. All right. Um, so one way to plan your documentation is by starting to kind of list out all of the usage scenarios that you're anticipating and this is something um, I did for an actual project um, as part of Season of Docs, actually. So yeah, Metanorma is a tool which um, lets you create standardization documents, but from the command line. And a lot of their users were coming from a um, visual interface um, style environment like Word. And for them, um, it's scary to think about, oh, I have to wait, run the command line to get a doc? Um, so the, the hurdle that this um, open source project faced was adoption. Um, so in this plan, we're thinking about who is doing what, also which context. And you can, you know, this one just covers installation and, and trying it out. But basically what you're going to do is kind of list out all of your scenarios, onboarding, configuration, troubleshooting. And next, you're going to add on to how will they actually feel when they do this. Um, so with our audience and from, from user interviews that I ran while I was onboarding, I knew that a lot of folks were just plain scared of the CLI. They didn't want to do anything wrong. They were afraid to break things. So while they were curious, um, otherwise they probably wouldn't even try this thing, um, they also felt overwhelmed and maybe even frustrated or scared. And that kind of, those two first things inform the content that you're, that you're going to need. So you can um, list this out um, into bullets or just go pretty broad. In my case, you know, there's only so much space on the slide. And in the last um, column, you're going to map out how often something happens or will happen, like you can anticipate here. And this is where the time element comes in. All of the techniques that I outlined, for example, using text and images together to illustrate your point, or even producing a video or something like that, takes a lot of time, right? So you kind of want to focus on what's important to your project, which barriers are the most pressing, and you know how likely are they to happen. So this is where you put in all of the love and detail and use all of the techniques that I kind of showed you before. Um, and then for things like, you know, that aren't as important to your project, maybe because you already have experienced people and they don't need that level of love, you can kind of scale back a little bit. All right, so first thing, make a plan. Um, that's kind of the bird's eye view. Let's go one level deeper onto the page level. What can you do on the page level? Ta-da! <laughs> this is where my project, the Good Docs project, comes in. Um, we are producing templates for developers that have to write documentation. And uh, we are basically packing, um, packing best practices into templates that you can use. Um, we have a whole array of things by now. So we're, I think, version 1.2 or something like that. Um, and yeah, we, we're updating this um, every few months. So we have new templates coming in all the time. So that we are hosting currently on GitLab and you can find us at the URL down below. And the slides are also linked. And yeah, basically we don't, we don't just throw you into the deep end with a template. We're nice people. We also have guides <laughs> coming with our templates. 
And um, yeah, basically, if you have any questions around how to fill out a template, you'll most likely find everything that you need in a guide. Uh, but you can also just ask us on Slack. Um, yeah, and with that, just shameless plug, do yourself a favor and check out our templates real quick. And then I'll cover what you can do on a paragraph and sentence level next. All right. Cool. So yeah, sentence level. Um, for those of you that have been here the whole day, they might have already heard about style guides. Um, but for those that are new to this, um, style guides basically ensure consistency on the paragraph level, on a sentence level, and usually the rules that make it into a style guide, um, and they kind of already embody content best practices and are very much in alignment with all of those principles of how cognition works. Um, even if some of the people maybe aren't aware, but um, yeah, so what you can find in the style guide possibly is advice on how to structure your paragraphs, like only do one idea at a time, or you can find things like um, use a bulleted list, but don't exceed seven list items because then you're overwhelming people. <laughs> and this is a style guide that Google maintains, and I'm very happy that they open sourced it. Um, but there's also others, like Microsoft has one open, available, GitLab as well. And either you can just stick to them as they are, or you can use them and make your own. So with that, um, I've put in a summary, so more like for the deck, so if you're reviewing it on your own, you, you can use this as a cheat sheet. Uh, I will not do PowerPoint karaoke now, but rather I want to leave you with a few resources, if, if this was interesting to you, there's a whole array of uh, papers and books and, and online courses that are free and you can use them. And um, yeah, uh, one disclaimer before we do questions. So everything that I described is kind of a summary of science as, you know, as it had been conducted. And I don't know whether they also looked at um, people that aren't neurotypical. So maybe some of these things, you could ma uh, maybe take them with a grain of salt if you know, for example, oh, I have ADHD, that never works for me. Um, so yeah, if you're an expert on that matter, feel free to approach me. I would like to improve my talk. And um, yeah, shall we do questions? All right. Okay, so I have Carrie over here, so maybe just raise your hand if you have a question and she'll come to you. Don't be shy. <laughs> there are no dumb questions. All right. That's good. So uh, you mentioned like a few different types of processing. You mentioned audio and visual, mm -hmm. um, but you didn't mention things like like tactile processing or um, like I don't know if even like speaking like it helps me remember if I mm -hmm. talk to others somebody else about it. Um, do you have any tips for how to like incorporate even more forms into documentation? So for example, like do you find that uh, like interactive documentation tutorial where somebody is also typing the thing and compiling mm. the thing, uh, do you find that that's more effective or do you have any tips about that? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so maybe short sidebar here. So you've seen other senses on the slides as well, even the nose, right? So in theory, you could even use your smell for certain types of problems. So for example, I think in, in railway shops when they do maintenance, sometimes if something smells off, they know that they need to go check and um, replace the oil. We're mostly, uh, I did meet some hardware folks, but most of the folks um, that I work with, they are in software, and usually software doesn't smell. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, someone made a really funny joke, like sometimes it stinks. Yeah, uh, true. So there's only like, we can probably only stick to like um, visual inputs, like haptic to an extent. I mean, you probably won't really remember using your mouse because again, that's something that you've just like a procedure, right? That's not nothing that's new to you. Um, but you are making a good suggestion in, um, there are like things like code labs where you mix documentation 
and run code at the same time. And I think those help tremendously with learning um, if you have a setup that allows you to, to, to do that, because it can be tricky to set up. So sometimes I would say there are tooling constraints um, that kind of hold us back from the optimal learning experience. Um, but yeah, nothing in life is optimal. We just kind of work with whatever we have, right? So, but yeah, your, uh, your suggestion makes sense, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask if uh, the use of subtitles in videos could be detrimental for the uh, for that uh, overlapping loop that we were talking before about. Because mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of people, example, we watch Netflix, for example, and we, yeah. and we watch it with subtitles. I'm wondering whether or not that is detrimental because we hear the person speaking and so on. You, yeah, this is interesting. Um, I find that if, so I, <laughs> I also like to watch content with subtitles, even though if I hear the content. And I find that if the subtitle, for whatever reason, doesn't match with what you hear, for example, in on animes, right, there's lip syncing and then some other person writing separately subtitles, um, then it just bothers me completely. So I think the, the level or, or the intensity of the reading when you watch content is different than when you um, consume documentation so or even listen to a presentation because basically, um, or at least from my own observations, you more like scan, um, scan the subtitles to complement for things that you didn't get. Let's say you were munching on like uh, chips or so that are very loud, um, <laughs> then you kind of um, use that to supplement your understanding. Um, whereas something that requires focus um, is a kind of different intensity of the reading that you put into. And also um, another thing that helps with subtitles is they're incredibly short. So it's easier for you to retain that level of information. Uh, in general though, yeah, in theory, it's not optimal, <laughs> but it kind of depends on your circumstances. I also know of people that um, if they forgot their headphones, they will just turn off their audio altogether and just read. So um, that's not a, you know, subtitles are awesome. Please stick to doing them if you, if you produce videos. Um, and I think most likely your, your user will figure it out. Yeah, any other questions in the room? I think I saw a hand up here. Um, when you talk about making a plan um, for yeah. all the different use Let's cases and, and... Go back and yep. let's make a plan. Um, cool. Yes, yeah. all the different scenarios, that's what it's looking for. Yeah. Um, how detailed do you get with that? Because you can imagine any reasonable sized project, you're going to get into the hundreds of, of scenarios. Um, and then do you keep, like, is that a living document, the plan? Does it stay as you're working on documentation? Does it get updated? Mm -hmm. does, it, does it stay, like, is it relevant to keep it around after you have documentation? Um, kind of depends on what you're trying to do. So I, I know we've we talked a little bit earlier. So I would say in your use case, um, you're probably trying to stem up um, the first body of content, probably. Um, so listing out the, the use cases that are most important for that initial set of content uh, would be fine. Um, and in theory, you can add more scenarios to that. Um, I haven't seen people do it as much um, just because um, for smaller changes, you wouldn't necessarily make a documentation plan. So basically for initial STEM, STEM work and also delegation, right? This is very good to sync several heads especially if you're in different localities and if uh, some of them are volunteers, some of them are FTs. Um, this lets you delegate work really nicely, but once you've published content and you're more of a, um, in a maintain, maintain, sorry, the maintenance phase, um, usually people don't make the effort to update the documentation and then go back and update the plan. Um, so this is kind of time bound, I would say, usually. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Any any other questions? 
or do y'all when I go home? I know it's like, it's almost five. Oh, hey, we have one more. Yay, thank you. Um, you mentioned the Good Docs project where you guys are putting templates together with best practices. Um, how do you figure out these best practices and can you like give some insight into, into some of the, like, the discussions or debates to make sure that they're mm -hmm. optimal? Oh yeah. <laughs> so um, templates are like babies because they take up to nine months to make it into the repository. <laughs> um, and that is because, um, you know, first of all, we have volunteers work on it and they usually spend like maybe two hours per week um, on it. And um, usually the template creation process um, will start with exhaustive research on what's been said publicly before about this. Um, we do not have access to journals really because they're usually they're paywalled. Um, but so we go off of um, kind of getting a consensus of the tech writing landscape on when they document a certain thing like an APA reference, what do they kind of define as good? And some of our newer templates now also have a file where you can kind of check on all of the references. So we're kind of getting more rigid in our um, template process as well. And after this initial like consensus finding what is good, um, we are basically trying to, a lot of times there's like duplication. Some people said the same things, but in different words. So, you know, can I kind of disambiguate a little bit and structure it? Um, and usually we have people coming in from different levels of experience when it comes to tech writing. Um, so say if someone who wants to create a template and they're new to tech writing, um, they come up with a structure and so on, um, they will usually get peer review by more um, senior tech writers as well um, who, can, who usually have a good grasp on will this actually fly or not are those sections used in, in the real world or not. But speaking of like, are those sections used in the real world or not? Um, Carrie and I, uh, we're conducting some user research. So if you have used one of our templates, feel free to reach out to me uh, to report back on how useful those were because we continually strive to get better. Um, yeah, so usually research, um, some own thinking and then getting loads of rounds of peer review. That's usually what our process looks like. Yeah, good question, thank you so much. All right, I think I'll, I'll let you go now and um, enjoy the sunny weather in Seattle. Have a very nice evening, y'all. <laughs>